All right. Moving on. Let's see. Crank this down again. See what we get. Twelve. World's End Harem. Okay. All right. I got five-ish minutes into World End Harem. God damn, that was fucking boring. Like, aside from the comically over-censored opening shot, this was just unbelievably boring. Like, I know it's just the setup, but you gotta make the setup interesting, guys. Totally flat, uninteresting characters. The main dude has MS? And he's he just seems totally fine about it. Like, I get it's the future and he just has to go into cold storage for a bit until they have a cure, but... <clears throat> he doesn't show, like, any emotion about it at all. And I, I don't care. <sighs> I, re I really wish that this show had just been straight up cancelled instead of pushed back a whole season, because this was supposed to air in the fall season, but I guess the first episode was so fucking horrific, and the production schedule was so far behind that they had to push it to this season. Which, I've only seen... I only remember having one time before. I think it was like... Um... Fa... Fa... 2016, I think? Yeah, summer 2016. Uh, I think it was Regalia of the Six Stars or whatever. Like, that got three episodes out, and then the production crashed and had to get pushed back a season. Um, but yeah, this show sucks. It looks completely flat and uninteresting. It's not broken anymore. The animation's not broken anymore. But it's just boring looking, and that sucks. Uh, yeah, let's move on. Alright, get this the fuck off the list. Let's see what's next. Uh, nine. What is that? Hakozume. I feel like this was some kind of buddy cop show or something. Let's jump into it. Alright, I watched the first episode of Hakazume, which I believe the English title is Police in a Pod, I think. And I don't know what to make of this one. It wasn't good, I know that much, but I really don't I don't know what it's going for in a lot of ways. It's it's not funny, but I'm not sure if it's trying to be funny or if it's No, it's definitely trying to be funny at some points, but it just doesn't really go all in on the joke. It's just very super mild comedy, more s s bending towards slice of life, I guess. But it, it's got like workplace comedy elements where it's like uh, the bureaucracy of being a cop, I guess. I wouldn't exactly call this copaganda, mostly because all of the cop characters are not likable at all but more so it's a, like it it does have those elements of like the public is ungrateful for the job that they do but again that does that's not helped by the fact that these characters are super fucking unlikable and just generally not interesting um it does it did occasionally have some interesting, like, mildly poignant moments, like where it talked about how, um, like this burglar would go into neighborhoods where people would ride double on bikes because the community was not as engaged with itself on that level, and so he thought it would be easier to do break-ins there, as opposed to neighborhoods where people, like, say hi to each other all the time and stuff, so... Which is true, like, that's an interesting, um, out outlook on it is how, like, community is sort of very important in preventing crime. So it has, like, mild moments like that throughout it, but overall this is, 
it's not a very engaging or entertaining show. It, it really is slice of life in a lot of ways. It is a slice of these officers' lives on the job. And it's not always interesting. Sometimes it's just boring. But they didn't present it, the boring stuff in an interesting way, so I just wasn't really engaged with it. Uh, it's not particularly good looking either. It's mostly just still shots of characters talking and a couple panning shots. There's there's not a lot of ambition being thrown into this particular work. I did think for a moment that I briefly thought that I recognized the character designs, but I think it's just because they're... This is a Madhouse show, and so the character designs definitely feel like mid to late 2000s Madhouse. And I, I looked it up, the character designer... I don't think has done character designs ever before, at least not according to Mal, but they have done a lot of key animation stuff, like pretty much all over the spectrum, from Naruto to FMA Brotherhood to Black Lagoon to fucking the original Fruits Basket, On and they were the chief animation director for the new Boogie Pop. So that was interesting, just on a staff level, but... Not a particularly good looking show either, so I think I'm gonna pass on this one. So, let's move on. Alright, Hakozume is off the list. Let's move on. Let's see what we get next. 14. What is 14? Kaijin Kaihatsu no Kuroitsu san. No fucking clue what this is. Let's give it a go. Alright, well, for some reason I finished all of Miss Kuroitsu from the Monster Development Department. Um, that was a very totally super average show. Like, that's really the only way I could describe it. It's a comedy um, with a transforming hero bend to it as it turns out. So it's basically like, it takes the, it's one of those anime that takes like previous like anime or like kaiju tropes and filters it through the lens of corporate comedy uh, or just corporate Japan in general. Very much a Heaven's Design Team kinda series. Um. I like this one better than Heaven's Design Team, but it's still, on the whole, very unremarkable. There are a couple interesting ideas in it. Like, it actually, I guess a lot of the character, one bit, like, one-off characters in it are actual, like, local heroes from Japan. Like, in Japan, they have uh, different towns or different prefectures have, like, transforming heroes that represent the town. Like, this, like, in real life, like, they have, like, mascots, and a bunch of those mascots show up in this show. So that was kind of cool. It re this show really does like the idea of the, the henshin, the transforming hero stuff. You can definitely feel the roots of that genre all over this fucking show. And it never feels like a... It, it feels like a earnest installment of it. I will give it that much. Uh, the writing's not particularly great, but it wasn't particularly bad either. Uh, some of the jokes were pretty funny, um, but a lot of them, especially by the end of the show, I was coming up with better punchlines in my head than what was actually on screen. So, but by that point I was so close to the end that I just Figured I'd finish the show just for the fuck of it. Uh, last episode kind of sucked, though. It went full action, and it was just boring, and the action's not particularly good either. The show's not particularly good-looking overall. Um, it's not especially ugly, but, it, again, it, re it doesn't have a particular aesthetic to it. It doesn't... It's, it feels a little cheap in a lot of areas. 
Um, but it, ha it has a couple nice cuts here and there. Uh, has some decent fan service. I'll give it that much. Uh, big titty anime girls. I like them. I like a big titty wolf girl. Well, technically, wolf boy, because that's the other interesting thing about this show is there's at least two examples of gender dysphoria? Not ri well, just gender identity issues in general. Like, so we have the one character, Wolf Bet. Wolf Beto? I, I have no idea how you pronounce it. Uh, but essentially, um, it was a monster that they were developing. And they, d they designed the brains for the monsters first, and this brain was designed as a boy, but at the last second, they changed the body to being a girl's body, so it's, like, it is literally, like, the idea of gender dysphoria, like, it is a boy's mind inside of a girl's body, so, it plays around with that idea in some ways that are kind of interesting, and some ways that are just not at all interesting or just questionable but it is an in, at least an interesting idea and then there's the other one where there's like a magical girl duo that shows up every now and then and one of them is actually a guy but he transforms into a magical girl uh, which I believe we saw in Magical Girl Raising Project as well but that show sucked so no point mentioning it here, but it is an interesting idea. They don't explore those ideas any more than what I just talked about, so that's unfortunate, but the idea is there. Um, honestly, that's all I have to say about this show. It's kind of funny. It's not offensively bad in any way. It's not outright bad in any way. It's just... This is a, this is a light to light to decent five just straight down the fucking middle honestly i don't really know why i bothered finishing it other than the f i like transforming heroes um yeah and um it's it's fine it's an okay totally average show uh let's go to the list all right Kuro Itsu san. Um, unfortunately, you're at the bottom of the list here, but at least you got finished. And you're getting a light five. Alright. Let's see who is next. Three. Blade Runner Black Lotus. This is a full CG series, I believe. Let's. Give it a go. Alright, got through about eight and a half minutes of the first episode of Blade Runner Black Lotus. Honestly, I should have given up earlier than that, but I wanted to at least get through the first action scene to see if it actually could hold water. And honestly, that's one of the most boring action scenes that I've seen this season. Um, not that I'm that far into this season, but it pretty fucking boring despite how it's a well choreographed action scene but it's not shot well at all like the and the way that it's animated just makes it feel less the way that it's animated and just the way that it's shot and the way the sound effects are built into it it just feels super weightless and with no impact on anything it's just I was I was surprised at this fight scene where I was like, it's this is a very technically uh, detailed fight scene that's just super fucking boring to watch. Like there's I felt absolutely nothing while watching it. That's what shocked me the most. Um. Also, the main character is nonsensical. I understand that she's lost her memory basically, but. She doesn't act like she doesn't act like someone fucking normal to begin with. She seems like a weird fucking alien person. I don't think she's what I've also never seen either Blade Runner movie. So what what synths? Is that what they're called? The robots or whatever? But 
I think they're also supposed to act human anyway. But um, I I did see uh, Blackout, the one um, that Shinji Watanabe or Shinichiro Watanabe uh, did. Um, that one was okay, actually. Um, a little weak in animation in certain areas, but I thought it was pretty okay. Um, Black Lotus utterly fails in every conceivable way compared to that. And I only gave Blackout, uh, like, a six or so. Um, this one is just... the the just boring. I'm utterly bored by everything I'm seeing on screen. Um, keep in mind, I just came off of a comedy that I just described as totally average in every area. So, when I say, this is boring, trust me, it's boring. <laughs> um... The CG's not bad. It's definitely above average for anime CG. But it also has these weird hiccups and very bizarre areas where something just looks slightly off. Like it's not supposed to move like that. And that it really throws me off when that happens. Um, I also just realized that this comes from both Kenji Kamiyama and Shinji Aramaki. Both people who were very important to the sci-fi and mecha scene in anime um, two decades ago, but really have not done much since. So I'm, I'm not sure why their names keep getting trotted out other than name recognition, but who the fuck recognizes their names now other than people like me? And people like me aren't going to fucking watch this show anyway, so... Why get them for this project? I I know these Kenji Kamiyama is still working on the the Netflix Ghost in the Shell um, CG series, which I also didn't like, but um, that's an entirely separate matter. But uh, yeah, really don't care for Blade Runner Black Lotus. It's just completely unmemorable and unimportant in any way. Not unimportant, just completely... What's the word I'm looking for? Unimpressive, just... Un... No, not notable in any way for anything. Let's move on. Alright, Blade Runner off the list. We're down to 25 shows now, so 24 plus Precure at the end. Let's see what's next. 18. What do we got for 18? Ooh, Sabiku Ibisco. I've been excited to see this one just out of sheer insanity. Hope it lives up to my expectations. Let's go. All right, I just finished all of Sabiku Ibisco, and on the whole, that was a pretty solid show. I had some issues, which we'll get into in a bit, but on the whole, I enjoyed myself with what I thought was going to be a real dumb as rocks action series. And it is that at times, but more so it's just like a straightforward action series, really. Um, that's a pretty standard structure overall. Gets solid introduction, gets a little episodic in the middle, and then has a nice solid conclusion to wrap it up. But it's in the finer details where I find a lot of the... Uh, core strengths of this series. Um, one, it's this um, it was it has a lot of um, drug undertones to it, like not undertones but more like metaphors, if you will. Like essentially, it's a world where uh, people are being eaten away by a disease called rusting, and mushrooms apparently or specifically one kind of mushroom are the cure for it but there's this big propaganda campaign against mushrooms and mushroom growers or whatever they're called um, by the government um, and it turns out that one of the people leading that uh, disinformation campaign is doing it specifically because he wants to monopolize the healthcare industry surrounding the treatment of rust without curing it. So
So basically that big conspiracy of why haven't we found the cure for cancer yet because it's more profitable to treat cancer than it is to cure cancer. Um, so just replace mushrooms with weed and you have a very obvious metaphor for drugs. On the whole, I think it does a pretty solid job of just um, exploring how totalitarian anti-drug political regimes are very effective at spreading misinformation about drugs that are essentially harmless, often helpful. Um, of course, if you take this metaphor as far as it goes, then you do sort of end up in the weed is the cure-all magic drug territory. I don't think it's going for that especially, but you probably could read into that, and that's not the best reading of it, but, or not the best idea, I guess. But, uh, it's an interesting thing to think about. It's, uh, the, the finer details of the metaphor are definitely there. So, it's very interesting, because normally Japan is very anti-drug. Like, if you're not familiar, a lot of, uh, East Asian countries, um, are extremely, extremely anti-drugs. Um, Japan, like, basically, all drugs are equally bad to them. Like, weed is equally as bad as, like, cocaine or heroin over there. And, at least in terms of, like, how law enforcement treats them and public perception of it. Um, so, it's interesting to see a anime that actually is kind of pro-recreational well not even that just pro-illicit substances or at least not anti-illicit substances because I've seen plenty of anime that really go hard on the anti-drug stuff like uh, Ikebukuro Westgate Park from a couple seasons ago is definitely in that um, so, it's, a, it's an interesting thing to think about. Again, if you take the metaphor all the way to its logical conclusion, does start to feel like a stretch, but it's interesting to read into it that way. But even without the um, drug metaphor, it's still a pretty solid series overall. It's got some really great, charming characters. This is very much in the hot-blooded uh, anime realm of action series. Uh, the main character, one of the main characters is dumb as rocks, and I love it. Um, and of course he's got his little soft boy, smart doctor companion with him, so they make a perfect uh, traveling duo. Um, might be gay? I'm going to read into it as gay, especially, like, they don't, okay, so, once again, these videos are spoiler heavy, so, go watch this show, it's pretty good, so, episode 9, uh, Bisco, one of the main characters, dies, like, Terminator 2 style, um, and as he, like, as he dies, um, the other guy, um, Milo, says that he loves him. Like, I, I believe those it was Aishiteru uh, in Japanese. Which I've never known to be a friendship kind of love or a brotherly kind of love. I've no I've only ever heard that in re reference to romantic love. And the very end of the series does have a kind of romantic moment to it. So I'm reading that as gay. Uh, which is also... Pretty interesting for an action series. Um, you don't really get that a lot, especially in this gen genre and aesthetic of show. Um, that was kind of cool, and I think it's a 
solid ship overall. They have some really great chemistry and they've really grown close to each other over these past, over their uh, however long of adventuring. So, solid ship. Personally, I sh I'm more in the uh, Milo and Tiro uh, sect of things because they also had some pretty solid romantic back and forth earlier in the series. But, uh, who knows? Uh, I haven't read the white novels. I don't think this is getting a sequel anytime soon. Um, but, uh, so yeah, if you want, if you want a gay subtext to something, not even gay subtext, just, what's the, what's the word I'm looking for? Subplot. That's the word I'm looking for. A gay romance subplot that's just vaguely there in the hints of things in, like, scattered throughout it, man, this might be for you. Uh, oh, also, loved the villain for this, uh, series, uh, for the most part. Um, the governor Kurokawa, he's just very archetypal, uh, big bad conspiracy government man, who just wants power and wants to monopolize power, but he just does it so effectively and so pointedly that it just really works for me. Also, he's voiced by Kenjiro Suda, um, who you might know as Overhaul in My Hero Academia. Um, I think Kenjiro Suda might be the might have the most terrifying voice in modern voice acting for anime. Like he just really fucking nails that typecasting, and I fucking love his voice. Uh, it's just, it gives me goosebumps every fucking time. Now, uh, I really like his character up until his character dies and then is reincarnated inside of a giant ro uh, robot. That's where the show kind of falls apart for me, uh, is both Kurokawa and Bisco die in ep at the end of episode 9. Uh, and then the last three episodes, it really just loses steam because it's just one giant, one long fight against a giant robot uh, that basically goes full Nausicaa. Uh, if you remember the giant robots from the end of Nausicaa. Um, definitely a lot of those vibes to this. Uh, especially with just how massively destructive it is. Again, it's like a, it's a metaphor for me uh, weapons of mass destruction. I mean, the series opens with Tokyo getting blown to shit by one of these things, apparently. So, um, in concept, I think it's perfectly fine. I think the, I mean, that's just a constant force in anime. The threat of nuclear weapons, the threat of massively destructive weapons, but it stretches this over like three, like two and a half episodes, and it just gets tiresome, like it really loses steam, and it just gets kind of repetitive trying to attack this thing over and over and over again, and also Bisco comes back to life at the end, so, uh, not super on the one hand, we didn't get the bury your gaze ending, so that's a plus. But on the other hand, they really don't fucking explain it that well at all. If they did explain it, I just didn't fucking understand it. Um, and it's just not interesting. On top of the fact that the giant robot thing is just not an interesting antagonist for this last arc like it is basically the reincarnation of Kurokawa uh, that's just laying waste to everything in his path but he is not really Kurokawa anymore he's just like the last vestiges of him which you could read as like the the vestiges of a past regime still haunting uh, the current political landscape but narratively it's just not that interesting like he's just a giant shambling monster that blows shit up, and he's just, it's just not a, interesting to fight, um, in comparison to just normal human Kurokawa, uh, so, 
the last three episodes of this really lost steam for me. Um, looked cool. Um, even like the giant CG Tetsujin, the giant robot, didn't look that bad. Um, in terms of like C CG models, it pretty, looked pretty okay for the most part. Um, and same with the giant crab that they ride throughout the series, which is kind of cool. That's another thing that I do like about this series, is it has such a cool aesthetic to it. It's got a very Mad Max kind of aesthetic, uh, desert wasteland shit, um, with uh, radioactive monsters, overgrown radioactive monsters everywhere. Um, so, I really do like the aesthetic of this show, so that's definitely a huge plus for it. Uh, it's just a shame that it had this weird, over bloated, over overly drawn out ending. Um, another major complaint that really shows up big time in the sec in the last couple episodes is uh, injuries. Really, they really stretch the boundaries of how badly you can injure these fucking people. Like, in one moment, like the doctor. Uh, Milo, Milo gets thrown like several hundred feet by the giant robot into a stone wall and he makes like a fucking crater in the wall and he just gets up afterwards. Um, so it's, and that happens so often in this show. Like, these characters feel indestructible, so a lot of the tension just kind of goes away sometimes. It still looks cool, for the most part, so I'm not... I don't hate it, but it could have been so much better if they actually gave, like, uh, weight to these injuries, if these injuries actually fucking meant anything, and instead of just a dude getting shot 12 times in the chest and then just keep pushing forward. Uh, it, it definitely has that issue to it. Um, yeah, that's... Yeah, that's... I think that's about all I have to say in terms of the broad strokes. But again, this show has some really... Despite the dumb action tropes, as it were, like the dumb, the very common action drawbacks, bloated climax, injury doesn't really mean anything, all the standard action tropes. The characters are just super likable for the most part. I especially liked Tyrol, um, this lone merchant who just pushes everyone away because she doesn't want to uh, have to deal with relationships. I felt very seen. <laughs> um, her episode six for her has a really great moment with her in it uh, that I just loved. Um, so yeah, really solid cast. Love the old man character, the old man mentor character for um, what was his name, Chabi. Uh, yeah, just really, I like this show overall. Didn't uh, could have been better. Ending kind of just dragged its feet to the end, just. But I would still recommend this overall. I would say this is a good show overall. I don't think I would watch a sequel because I don't know where it would go from here. Honestly, it almost felt like an anime original ending, in some ways. I have no way to confirm that because I haven't read the light novel. I don't think it's an anime original ending because I haven't heard anything about that. But it certainly felt that way in a lot of senses. Um, so, yeah, that's Sabiku Ibisco. Again, would recommend, but it does have some faults that need to be taken note of. Alright, Sabiku Ibisco is done, and we're going to put it right here. We're going to give that a light. Seven. Could have been better. Could have been less dragged out at the end, but liked it overall.